Greetings, brothers and sisters, and uh, welcome to our number nine in our viewing in the series, uh, our higher calling. And uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, a need of Sabbath reforms, and uh, let us pray as we begin the session. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for their love and their guidance. Thank you for their mercies. And we pray that uh, their praises may be with us as we study thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one of the topics I'm looking at is uh, a need of Sabbath reform uh, in this uh, higher calling. A need of Sabbath reform. And uh, we are going to go through some few things. We are going to look at the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13. We have to come to a frightening mountain or a scary place. We have no fear for off or trembling. This is a heavenly place where angels dwell. We have come to be the community of Christ. We have come to the mediator between God and humankind. Jesus Christ our Lord. We come with reverence and awe. Oh, this is in Hebrew chapter 12. In uh, Nehemiah chapter 12 verses 22 we read, And I commanded the believers that they should clean themselves and that they should go and guard the gate, sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. One of the things that uh, needs to be addressed in these last days is uh, the reformation on Sabbath. People just take it lightly, but it is an end time issue, and that is what you are looking at. Nehemiah 13 describes a time somewhat removed from the first chapters. Nehemiah has now returned to Jerusalem from his homeland, verses 6 to 9. While some feel he had been gone for about 18 months, most think it could have been up to 12 years. So context is the king. One of the temple's requirements that Nehemiah had put in place early on was the use of storerooms to contain the contribution, first fruits, and tithes. See Nehemiah 12, 44-47. When Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem from Babylon, he discovered that this had been changed. Eliashib did evil when he had provided Tobiah with a room in the course of the house of God. Prior to Nehemiah's trip, this area had been used to store the offerings, temple articles, and the tithes. And it is uh, believed that there was um, a marriage that happened in the family of Eliashib and Tobiah, and so he ended up being given the part of the house of God. Upon returning, Nehemiah ordered Tobiah's household goods out of the room and gave orders to purify the area, returning the rooms to the original purpose in the house of God. I also found out, Nehemiah 13, 10 says, I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who had conducted the service had gone back to their field. There being no tithes, there, there being no offerings, there, there was no survival uh, for the priests and the Levites, and so they had to go to normal work. The people were supposed to give a tithe for the support of the Levites, and the Levites were to give a tithe of what they received for the support of the temple. When Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem from visiting the Persian king, where he had made his report on his work, he discovered that the giving of tithes was not being done as commanded by God. Therefore, the Levites had to go back to work in their field in order to support themselves and their families. So I remonstrated with the officials and said why is the house of god forsaken and i gathered them together and set them in their stations nehemiah 13 11. nehemiah called on the jewish officials to account for why they had disregarded and not enforced the law of god on tithing when he gathered the leaders together and reprimanded them he also assigned them to do their various duties and collect the tithes for the levites nehemiah's question echoed through the streets of jerusalem why is the house of God neglected by forsaking their duties? The priest had backslid and not serving in the Lord's temple. Nehemiah 13, 11. Nehemiah had the city doors shut on the Sabbath, beginning on Friday evening, with guards posted to see them that merchandise was not brought in. Even so, some merchants stayed all night outside the walls, perhaps hoping people would sleep outside in the darkness to purchase their goods. When Nehemiah heard of this, he threatened to use force against them. Uh, then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil in the, into the storehouse. And uh, as uh, you can see, as we are uh, um, in this period, is that the work of the Lord has been neglected. 
there are no levers, there are no priests to do the work of God. And many have resorted to go to look for jobs so that they may be able to sustain themselves and their families. The, the, the current organization is not what we should be having uh, as uh, per the prophet and uh, the Bible to the law and to the prophet. This is not the organization that we should be having. And so there need to be a reformation, there need to be a storehouse, and there need to be a return of tithes and offering to support the Levites and the priests that do the work of uh, the Lord. This can only be achieved by a proper order and organization uh, according to the gospel order, which uh, we shall be touching in uh, subsequent series. The storehouse was similar to warehouses that surrounded the temple and were used to store the tithes for distribution to the priests and Levites. The tithes brought indicate the type of agricultural practices of the Israelites. The grain would have been, would have probably been mostly wheat. The wine was from their vineyards and the oil was from their olive groves. Who tills the land will be blessed. And I appointed as treasures over the storehouse the priest Shelemiah, the scribe Zadok, and Pediah of the Levites. And as their assistant Hannah, son of Zakur, son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful and their duty was to dispute to their associates. I'll be dealing with the gospel order so that um, we may not just pass over these things as if there is nothing important in them. There need to be a Sabbath reform and there need to be a reorganization, a gospel order, which is not there. The priest Nehemiah chose to serve as treasurers who are known to be faithful in previous duties and their ancestors were important families from the time tribe of Levi. Their duty was to give the Levites the tithes they were supposed to receive and also collect a tithe from the Levites. They would have been honest task or tithe collectors. And do you remember in the times of the E.G. White, we had a tithe collector who went about collecting tithe and he was, um, the person was paid from the tithes and offering. We shall be looking at these things. <laughs> Nehemiah 13, 14, remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Nehemiah wanted God to remember how he had done his duty to bring decency and order to the priest and the people through his reforms. He prayed that his reforms would not be reversed or wiped out in subsequent years. He wanted God to protect him from all of his enemies and to remember his good deeds as good reason to protect him. 1315, in those days I saw in Judah people trading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on dungies and also wine grapes, figs, all kinds of burdens which they brought into the Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them at that time against selling food. The Sabbath began at sunset on Friday and ended at the sunset on Saturday. A priest blew a trumpet to officially indicate the beginning and the ending of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day to honor and to worship God and learn God's word from the scriptures as the synagogue later practiced. The fourth commandment established the Sabbath and encouraged rest for servants and animals as well as their masters. But this were being not done. <laughs> Tyrians also who lived in the city brought in fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah and in Jerusalem. Nehemiah described the commerce of his day just as. Uh, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Let us see what is really happening here. Uh, we are in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13. I hope you have your Bible so that uh, everything doesn't go wrong. <laughs> Yes. Nehemiah described the commerce of his day just as the Israelites were supposed to collect enough manna in the wilderness on the day before the Sabbath because God will give them no manna on the Sabbath. The Jews were not supposed to buy or sell food on the Sabbath or do either kind of trading but buy enough for the Sabbath before the Sabbath began. And we are told to not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Why will the children of Israel 
gang together with the people from Tyre to buy fish and merchandise on the Sabbath. This was apostasy. Then I remonstrated with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Nehemiah continued to find that traders were bringing loads of grain, fruit, and other things into the city of Jerusalem. During this period, he offered a stern warning that he would lay hands on them. You read Nehemiah 13.15. The nobles of Judah were very wealthy Jews who profited greatly from trade and, and around Jerusalem seven days a week. They encouraged foreign sellers to come to Jerusalem on the Sabbath rather than obey the law of God. Nehemiah called this uh, what it was. And uh, he said it was evil. It was evil. Did not your ancestors act in this way, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us on, on this city? Yet you bring more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. They were profaning the Sabbath by dishonoring God on the very day God had set apart for people to honor him, learn of him, study his law, and rest from their labors. God had punished Jerusalem in 587 BC with the destruction of the city. And the temple, because the Israelites had rebelled against him and profaned the Sabbath, and these nobles were doing the same thing and leading others to do the same thing again, which will lead to God's just punishment again. We are looking at uh, number nine, a need of Sabbath reform. It is in the series, Our Higher Calling, and uh, we, we, we shall be coming to some particular things just in a moment. I'm just going through the book of Nehemiah. When it began to be dark at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and gave orders they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I set some of my servants over the gates to prevent any burden from being brought in on the Sabbath day. Nehemiah could not trust the Jewish nobles or the foreign traders to do what was right in obedience to God or him. He knew that they would not obey him as the governor of Judah and Jerusalem. So at sunset he barred the gates of Jerusalem and he set his own guards suitably armed um, to prevent the violation of the Sabbath. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of merchandise spend the night outside Jerusalem once or twice. Nehemiah brought a quick stop to the profaning of the Sabbath with this, his measures of enforcement. It will not be profitable and uh, perhaps somewhat dangerous for merchants to sleep outside the city gates with their goods. In addition to this wasted time and money on their part, Nehemiah warned them to quit camping outside the city gates or he would punish them. But I warned them and said to them, 1321, why do you spend the night in front of the wall? If you do so again, I'll lay hands on you. From that time on, they did, did, on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Nehemiah knew that they could complete all their business the week before the Sabbath began or during the six days after the Sabbath ended. He probably did not want the city gates barred from throughout the Sabbath because this could prevent worshippers from coming to the temple from outside the city to worship on the Sabbath. If his threat did not mean imprisonment, it could have meant a severe beating. Nehemiah left them, or those of us reading this, in doubt about how he would punish them. But um, we remember that if anyone was to be found with a problem, he was to be scourged. And I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast uh, love, according to your steadfast love. And so we find that uh, Nehemiah uh, starts doing the reforms in Israel and uh, he is interested not in uh, gaining uh, uh, the praises of men but vindicating the character of God and uh, he is able even to risk his own life and risk his own reputation so that uh, the cause of God may be uh, vindicated so that the cause of God may be uh, so that the cause of God may be vindicated. What will we do at a such a time when actually the Sabbath of Lord is being uh, destroyed as reformers? What are we 
supposed to do. And so we are looking at the measures that Nehemiah took to be able to prevent the profanation of the Sabbath, and we are called to do the same. Our higher calling is to do uh, the same thing that uh, Nehemiah did. And uh, continuous, Nehemiah knew that they could complete all their business the week before the Sabbath began or during the six days of the Sabbath ended. And I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Nehemiah established order and enforced God's law, and then he turned the responsibility over to the Levites to do their job. They were to enforce the law of God and make certain that the Sabbath was truly observed. Once more, Nehemiah directed the Levites to purify themselves and then guard the gates to protect the, uh, the sanctity of the Sabbath. From this point on, no one would be permitted to buy or sell on that day of the week. God's people were to be a new creation, not falling again into the trap of selfishness and disobedience. Nehemiah was humble and knew that he was not perfect, so he prayed for God to spare him or save him, not because of all he had done to honor and obey God and enforce God's law, but because of God's steadfast love. He also prayed for God to spare him because he was in danger of assassination by the nobles of Jerusalem and Judah. Almost 500 years later, the nobles and religious leaders of Jerusalem arranged the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And so, the man at the peril of his life, he decided to do reforms. The man uh, uh, against anything else, uh, he says, it was good for me to be afflicted. It is good to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. Psalms 119 verse 71. And Christ says that those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be honest and repent. This is what God is calling on us if we will be used to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. And so this is the measures that Nehemiah took so that the Sabbath of the Lord may not be discredited. There are some things that we are called to do in such a time as this, even as Nehemiah reforms concerns us. And this is, I have been just looking at what Nehemiah did. We are looking at a need of Sabbath, Sabbath reform. The series is Our Higher Calling. And I want to enter into some things which are particular and which maybe will address our individual hearts as children of God. Because there, there need to be a, a reform to be done in this last day. Reformation need not end with Luther as many suppose. It has to be carried on till the end. And so let us enter into some things which are particular actually. To the parents, what do we get? This is uh, what um, we, we read. The children of Sabbath-keeping parents who have had great light, who have been the objects of the tenderest solitude, may be the ones who will leave a heritage of shame, who will sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. In the judgment, the names of those who have sinned against great light will be written with those who are condemned to be separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Uh, they will be lost, lost, and will be numbered with the scorners of grace Christ. Uh, this is some messages to young people, 87.3. The prophetess say, I would rather see my children laid in the grave than see them taking the path that leads to death. The terrible fact that I have nurtured children to fight against the holy God of heaven, to swell the ranks of apostates in the last days, to march under the ban blank ban of Satan, will indeed be a thought of horror to me. And so... We are looking at Sabbath reforms and we have entered into some particular things that you have to um, uh, you have to pay attention to. You have to pay attention to. Fathers and mothers, are you allowing your children to grow up in impurity and sin? A great good done for others will not cancel the debt you owe to God to care for your children. The spiritual welfare of your family comes first. Take them with you to the cross of Calvary, laboring for them as those that must give an account. Our higher calling, 304 paragraph 3. Parents should seek to gain the cooperation of their children. Thus children can become laborers together with God. Some households have a little church in their home. Mutual love binds heart to heart and the unity that exists among the members of the family 
preaches the most effectual sermon that could be preached on practical godliness. A higher calling 304, paragraph 4. As parents faithfully do their duty in the family, restraining, correcting, advising, counseling, guiding the, gu uh, guiding the father as priest of the household, the mother as home missionary, they are filling the sphere God will have them fill. By faithfully doing their duty in the home, they are multiplying agencies for doing good outside the home. They are becoming better fitted to labor in the church. By training their little flock discreetly, binding their children to themselves and to God, fathers and mothers become laborers together with God. The members of the family become members of royal family above, children of heavenly king. Children of uh, heavenly king. Uh, parents who have never felt the care which they should feel for the souls of their children and who have never given them proper restraint and instruction are the very ones who manifest the most bitter opposition when their children are restrained, reproved, or corrected at school. Some of these children are a disgrace to the church and disgrace to the name of Adventist 5T51.3. The house of God is often discredited and the Sabbath violated by Sabbath believers' children. In some cases, they are even allowed to run about the house, play, talk, and manifest their evil tempers in the very meetings where the saints should worship God in the beauty of holiness. And the place that should be holy and where a holy stillness should reign and where there should be perfect order, neatness, and humility is made to be a perfect Babylon confusion. This is enough to bring God's displeasure and shut his presence from our assemblies. Children should be restrained. Parents, it is your duty to have your children in perfect subjection, having all their passions and evil tempers subdued. And if children are taken to meeting, they should be made to know and understand where they are, that they are not as at home, but where God meets with his people. And they should be kept quiet and free from all play, and God will turn his face toward you to meet with you and bless you. Child Guidance 543.2 Continued on Child Guidance 544 your child should be taught to obey as the children of God obey. If this standard is maintained, a word from you will have some weight when your child is restless in the house of God. But if the children cannot be restrained, if the parents feel that the restraint is too much of an exaction, the child should be removed from the church at once. It should not be left to divert the minds of the hearers by talking or running about. God is dishonored by the loose way in which parents manage their children while at church. Uh, this is recorded for our benefit and instruction. The angel of darkness sometimes appears in the garment of affection, counseling us to walk contrary to the law of God. Parents may indulge their affection for their children at the expense of obedience to God's holy law. Guided by this affection, they disobey God by allowing their children to carry out wrong impulses and withhold the instruction and discipline which God has commanded them to give them to give. When parents thus disregard the commands of God, they imperil their own souls and the souls of those, their children. By failing to walk in the way of the Lord, they allow Satan to work his will with the children. So, parents need to be careful when they are in the house of the Lord to restrain their children. There are few who realize far reaching is the influence of their words and acts, how often the errors of parents produce the most disastrous effects are upon their children and children's children. Long after the actors themselves have been laid in the grave, everyone is exerting an influence upon others and will be held accountable for the result of that influence. Words and actions have a telling power, and the long hereafter will show the effect of our life here. The impression made by our words and deeds will surely react upon ourselves in blessing or in cursing. This thought gives an awful solemnity to life and should draw us to God in humble prayer that he will guide us by his wisdom. If you have children, restrain them from running up and down in the church. Brothers and sisters, it is not a simple thing we are talking about. God is displeased by this manner. Parents letting the children loose in the church. And why does these things often happen? Because we have not uh, embrace discipline on our children in the family altar. The church starts at home. It doesn't charge in the building outside your home. And if your 
careful with the child in your home altar, then it will be easier to manage your child in the church. This was a counsel to parents in handling the children. To the church, this is what we are told. Do not have so little reverence for the house and worship of God as to communicate with one another during the sermon. If those who commit this fault could see the angels of God looking upon them and marking their doings, they would be filled with shame and abhorrence of themselves. God wants attentive hearers. It was while men slept that the enemy sowed tears. This talking in the house of God, communicating while the sermons are going on, brothers and sisters, is not the will of God. It is the will of Satan. We are talking about a need of Sabbath reform. It is in the series Our Higher Calling. Child Guidance 542. The moral test of the worshippers in God's holy sanctuary must be elevated, refined, and sanctified. This master has been sadly neglected. It is important, has been overlooked, and as the result, his order and reverence have become prevalent, and God has been dishonored. When the leaders or leaders in the church, ministers and people, fathers and mothers have not had elevated views of this matter, what could be expected of the inexperienced children? They are too often found in groups away from the parents who should have charge of them, notwithstanding they are in the presence of God and his eye is looking upon them. They are light and trifling. They whisper and laugh, are careless, irreverent, and inattentive. We are sowing to us a curse and not a blessing in these matters. We should be careful when we are coming in the house of the Lord. We should be careful to know where our children are when the services are going on. We, we cannot just be indifferent to what is going on. The fact that we have gone to the church with our children should not now make us think that we are, have a straight ticket to heaven. There is, is a need of a Sabbath reform. We are looking at a need of Sabbath reform. The series is a higher calling. God is calling us to restore the Sabbath, to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. When the worshippers enter the place of meeting, they should do so with decorum, passing quietly to their seats. If there is a strobe in the room, it is not proper to crowd about it in an intolerant, careless attitude. Common talking, whispering, and laughing should not be permitted in the house of worship, either before or after the service. Ardent active piety should be characterized, should characterize the worshippers. We are looking at uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 5, 492. If some have to wait a few minutes before the meeting begins, let them maintain a true spirit of devotion by silent meditation, keeping the heart uplifted to God in prayer that the service may be of special benefit to their own hearts and lead to the conviction and conversion of other souls. They should remember that heavenly messengers are in the house. We all lose much sweet communion with God by our restlessness, by not encouraging moments of reflection and prayer. The spiritual condition need to be often reviewed and the mind and heart drawn toward the sun of righteousness. If when the people come into the house of worship, they have genuine reverence for the Lord and bear in mind that they are in his presence, there will be a sweet eloquence in silence. The whispering and laughing and talking which might be without sin in common business, place should find no sanction in the house where God is worshipped. The mind should be prepared to hear the word of God that it may have due wait and suitably impress the heart. There are many people who are used to talking and whispering while the ministers are entering on the pulpit or the sermon is going on. Brothers and sisters, be warned. What you saw is what you shall read. When the ministers enters, it should be with dignified solemn man. He should bow down in silent prayer as soon as he steps into the pulpit. And honestly ask help of God. What an impression this will make. There will be a solemnity and awe upon the people. Their minister is communing with God. He is committing himself to God before he dares so stand before the people. Solemnity rests upon all and angels of God are brought very near. Everyone of the congregation also who fears God should be should with bowed head unite in silent prayer with him that God may grace the meeting with his presence and give power to his truth proclaimed from human lips. When the meeting is opened by prayer, every knee should bow in the presence of the Holy One and every heart should ascend to God in silent devotion. We are talking about a need of Sabbath reform. 
The prayers of faithful worshippers will be heard and the ministry of the word will prove effectual. The lifeless attitude of the worshippers in the house of God is one great reason why the ministry is not more productive of good. The melody of song poured forth from many hearts is clear, distinct utterance is one of God's instrumentalities in the work of saving soul. All the service should be conducted with solemnity and awe as if in the visible presence of the master of assemblies. 5492 paragraph 3. God has given men six days wherein to labor, and he requires that their own work be done in the six working days. Acts of necessity and mercy are permitted on the Sabbath. The sick and suffering are at all times to be cared for, but unnecessary labor is to be strictly avoided. Turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and honor him not doing thy own ways, nor finding thy own pleasure, Isaiah 58, 13. Nor that the prohibition end here. Nor speaking thy own words, saith the prophet. Those who discuss business matters or lay plans on the Sabbath are regarded by God as though engaged in actual transaction of business. To keep the Sabbath holy, we should not even allow our minds to dwell upon things of worldly character. And the commandment includes all within our gates, the inmates of the house, are to lay aside their worldly business during the sacred hours. All should unite to honor God by willing service upon his holy day. Paul Jackson Prophet 307, paragraph 3. And let me tell you, brethren, it is eternal life to keep the Sabbath holy. It is eternal life. In Amos 8, verses 1 and 7, this is what is written. Thus hath the Lord God should unto me, and beheld, a basket of summer fruit, and he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel, I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be holings in that day, said the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place, they shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poorer of the land to fail saying, When will the new moon be gone, and that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, what we may buy, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the excellence of Jacob, surely I'll never forget any of thy works. Christian service, page 41, paragraph 1. It's a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. They are professedly serving God, but they are more honestly serving mammon. This half and half work is a constant denying of Christ rather than a confessing of Christ. So many have brought into their church their own and subdued spirit and refined. Their spiritual taste is perverted by their own immoral, debasing corruption, symbolizing the world in spirit, in heart, in purpose, confirming themselves in lustful practices and are full of deception through and through in their professed Christian life, living as sinners claiming to be Christians. Those who claim to be Christian and will confess Christ should come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing and be separate. This breaking of the Sabbath, you go to the church and many things are done which are not connected to the Sabbath. The Lord is saying, come out among them and not touch that unclean thing and be separate, yet lest you receive the plagues with them. General Conference Bulletin, 1893, pages 132 to 133. I lay down my pen and lift up my soul in prayer that the Lord will breathe upon his backslidden people who are as dry bones that they may live. The end is near, stealing upon us so stillly, so imperceptibly, so noiselessly, like the muffled tread of the thief in the night to surprise the sleepers of God and unready. May the Lord grant to bring his Holy Spirit upon hearts that are now at ease, that they may no longer sleep as do others, but watch and be sober. This is to the church. Awake. Don't just do your own things in the church. Don't think of what you want to think. Don't whisper. Don't commune. Don't communicate in the Sabbath when the sermons are going on. 
before or after the Sabbath. Pray for the minister when they are entering into the church to minister unto you. And then the Lord will uh, honor us with his own presence. But we don't do these things. And the Lord is saying that if they can reform on these things, come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing and be separate, lest you receive the plagues with them. There is a need of a Sabbath reform. When the, the children of Israel saw that the priests were doing what they were doing, they, 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 they moved from Shiloh with indignation and decided that they will offer their offerings at home and it will be accepted rather than see what was happening in the sanctuary. Go to the small companies, worship with them. Where two or three are gathered in the name of the Lord, the presence of the Lord is there with you. It is rather that you be in the presence of of the angels alone than be in the counsel of evil doers which cannot hear the counsels of God. Warn the people with meekness and humbleness if they refuse to do these things and they would like to continue profaning the Sabbath of the Lord. Leave them alone. There comes a time when actually i said a change has to be taken in our lives. We don't have to continue with the multitude in doing wrong. God is not a God of numbers. God requires a people who are sanctified and are ready to honor him in spirit and truth. He doesn't travel with numbers. He travels with a few who are willing to honor his name and exalt Jesus Christ above everything else. To the leaders in church, this is what we are taught. The Lord has a controversy with his professed people in the last days. In this controversy, men in responsible position will take a course directly opposite to that pursued by Nehemiah and that we spend half of this, uh, of the beginning looking at uh, Nehemiah and the reforms he did. And the Lord is saying that men will do a work opposite to that of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was doing Sabbath reforms. And if Nehemiah was doing Sabbath reforms, then if men are doing opposite of Nehemiah, they are profaning the Sabbath. They will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but they will try to keep it from others by burying it beneath the rubbish of custom and tradition. In churches and in large gatherings in the open air, ministers will urge upon the people the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. You wonder if... E.G. White was a true prophet. I'm wondering. She says that there is coming a time when in churches, in our large gathering, that is come meetings, and all these are uh, open air meetings. The ministers will urge the people to the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. This is Sunday. I pray that I live to see this period. But how I pray to God also that this may never happen. It be a conditional prophecy. There are calamities on the sea and land, and these calamities will increase. One disaster following close up another upon another, and the little band of conscientious Sabbath keepers will be pointed out as the ones who are bringing the wrath of God upon the world by their disregard of Sunday. And so the ministers will tell the people to keep Sunday, the first day. It is for this reason that the house of sanctuary dedicated to God should not be made a common place. Leaders, you hear this. It is sacredness should not be confused or mingled with the common everyday feelings or business life. There should be a solemn awe upon the worshippers as they enter the sanctuary, and they should leave behind all common worldly thoughts, for it is uh, the place where God reveals his presence. It is as the audience chamber of the great and eternal God. They are therefore pride and passion, dissension and self-esteem, selfishness and covetousness, which God pronounced idolatry, are inappropriate for such a place. Child Garden 5.43 Five says, all should be taught to be neat, irreverence encouraged by display of apparel. We are talking about a need of Sabbath reform. The series is our higher calling. All should be taught to be neat, clean, and orderly in their dress, but not to indulge in that external adorning which is wholly inappropriate for their sanctuary. I'll be covering dress reform in the series, The Sanctuary. I pray that the Lord will help us. I'll go through the dress reform, the high priest, and all these things. So I'm going not to touch on it at large right now, the issue of dress. And we are told no education is complete without a proper guidance on dress, a, a dress reform. There should be no display of the apparel, for this encourages irreverence. All matters of dress should be strictly guarded following closely the Bible rule. Fashion has been the goddess who has ruled the outward, outside world, and she often insinuates herself into the church. The church should make the word of God her standard and parents should think intelligently upon this subject. Neither is it the object of preaching to amuse. 
Some ministers have adopted a style of preaching that has not the best influence. It has become a habit with them to weave answer dots into their discourses. The, Im the impression thus made upon the hearers is not a save of life unto life. Ministers should not bring amusing stories into their preaching. The people need pure provender, thoroughly winnowed from the chaff. Preach the word was the charge that Paul gave to, the tim to Timothy. And this is our commission also. The minister who mixes storytelling with the discourses is using strange fire. And those people who use strange fire in the sanctuary, do you remember what happened to Ab Abiram, Nadab? The ground swallowed them. God is offended. And they were not swallowed, but the fire consumed them. God is offended in the cause of truth is dishonored when his representative descend to the use of cheap, trifling words. TM 318, paragraph 1. There is a lot of um, scriptures, even you, you, you find somebody come into the church and the, the person is told, give out a story to the children. And what is this practice of uh, the storytellers coming and telling the children that uh, the hare went to heaven with the eagle or such a things like the, the hare competed with the a tortoise. And then at the end of the story, you are telling people what is the moral lesson. What kind of things are these like a hare can compete with a tortoise or such a things? This answer dot, have we lacked something in the Bible to tell the children how Daniel survived in the den of lions? Have we missed out to tell children how Samuel grew up in the godly way? Have we missed out how Jesus grew up? Are we missing up everything about Isaac and uh, these little children in the Bible who grew up in the fear of God? Can we tell a story to the children, a story that will elevate their minds and move them closer to God? We have to start telling them about uh, 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 some birds and uh, some things that uh, actually communicate when actually they don't communicate. We, we feed children with lies instead of telling them the truth. And we wonder why the children are not interested in the Bible because it has been made a fictitious book by weaving in our own things. This is part of breaking the Sabbath, brethren. It, is not, it shouldn't be learned like that. The people who give children stories and even the ministers who stand on the pulpit. They stand on the pulpit and the minister takes 20 minutes doing introduction of who he is, his family and all these things where he has traveled on all these things. He takes another 20 minutes talking how the church is good and all that thing. He takes another 20 in doing this. And the discourse is almost one and one hour, 20 minutes and only 15 minutes will be on, on, on the truth about God, on Reformation and revival. And instead of uh, even insisting on these things, he weaves in his own things and the whole church is laughing during all the sermon. And you wonder when Christ preached how many people actually laughed, when the disciples, when they had been filled with the latter rain, uh, early rain, when they preached who laughed. The people asked, what shall we do? after the discourse. Why is it that the preachers come on the pulpit and people are laughing? They go home and you ask somebody, how are you? Are you from the church? Yes, I'm from the church. What did the pastor say? No, the sermon was good. What kind of foolishness is that? There should be a sacred spot like the sanctuary of all where God is to meet with his people. There's so much being done in the sanctuary of God which should not be done. That place should not be used as a lunch room or a business room but simply for the worship of God. When children attend day school in the same place where they should assemble to worship on the Sabbath, they cannot be made to feel the sacredness of the place, and that they must enter with feelings of reverence. The sacred and common are so blended that it is difficult to distinguish them. The church should not be used as a lunch room. The church should not be used as a business room. The church should not be used for common things. Brothers and sisters, we are doing injustice to God. We are breaking the Sabbath by doing these things. Everything that is done in the house of God, which is not for the word of God, actually, this is part of the breaking of the Sabbath. Everything is made common so that God is not reverent in his own house. Can you allow such a things to happen in your own house, the things that we do in church? Can we become so irreverent in the house of the Lord and expect a blessing from him? We go to the church and we come out so cursed rather than being blessed. How sad, how filled with significance of the words, and Israel 
with him, the people whom God has chosen to stand as light to the surrounding nation were turning from their source of strength and seeking to become like the nations around them. And with Solomon, so with Rehoboam, the influence of wrong example led men astray. And as with them, so to a greater or less degree it is today with everyone who gives himself up to work evil. The influence of wrongdoing is not confined to the doer. No man liveth unto himself, none perish alone in the iniquity. Every life is a light that brightens and cheers the pathway of others, or a dark and desolating influence that tends toward despair and ruin. We lead others either upward to happiness and immortal life, or downward to sorrow and eternal death. And if by our deeds we strengthen or force into activity the evil powers of, the, of those around us, we share their sins. So we don't have just to accept things to go on. Touch not the ministers. Touch not the anointed. If the anointed will actually realize they are anointed, they will not be doing the things that they are doing. You are standing between the living and the dead. You have to do something that will be approved of God. And so we have read Nehemiah 13, 15 to 22. I will not read it. He did actually reformation in Israel. And he made sure that uh, they will not gather around the sanctuary to profane the Sabbath. I have kept this before our ministering brethren and begged them not to lengthen out their discourses. Some improvement has been made on this ground with very best result, but few discourses have exceeded an hour. While in America the light was given me in the night season concerning yourself, you had been speaking at a great length and still felt that you had not said all you wished to say and were asking for a little more time. One of dignity and authority stepped before you as you stood in the pulpit and said, you have given the people a large amount of matter to consider. One half of what you have been given will be of much greater profit than the whole. If energized by the Holy Spirit, it must make an impression to the human hearers. The Holy Spirit works the man, but if there are vital points to be made with, which are essential to be carried away by the hearer, a train of word is effacing that strong impression, pouring into the vessel more than it can retain, and is so much effort lost. To reverse the last half to be presented them, the mind is fresh to receive it, will be gathering up the fragment that nothing be lost and so the discourses should not when we when we are talking about someone's leave alone the bible studies the someone should not be more than an hour tm 142 paragraph 2 the minister is using strange fire when he mixes storytelling with his discourses you have men of all classes of minds to meet and as you deal with the sacred word you should manifest earnestness respect reverence let not the impression be made upon any mind that you are cheap surface speaker Weed out storytelling for, from your discourses. Preach the word. You would have had more shifts to bring to the master if you had constantly preached the word. You little understand the soul's great need and longing. Some are wrestling with doubt, almost in despair, almost helpless. And the people are just storytelling. So the prophet says, on a certain, prophetess says, on a certain occasion, when... Uh, Betterton, the celebrated Betterton, the celebrated actor, was dining with Dr. Sheldon, Archbishop of Canterbury. The Archbishop said him to him, "Pray, Mr. Betterton, tell me why it is that you actors affect your audience so powerfully by speaking of things imaginary." "My Lord," replied Betterton, "with due submission to your grace, permit me to say that the reason is plain." In it all lies in the power of enthusiasm. We on the stage speak of things imaginary as if they were real, and you in the pulpit speak of things real as if they were imaginary. You, can you have the children of the world become wiser than the children of God? They speak of things imaginary as if they were real. And the pastors and the elders, the laymen and the clergy on the pulpit speak of real things as if they were imaginary. And there is a spiritual lethargy in the church everywhere because people have become comedians. Be careful never to lose a sense of the presence of the divine watcher. Remember that you are speaking not only to an enlightened assembly but to one whom you should ever recognize. Speak as although the whole universe of heaven were before you as well as the hungry starving company of God's sheep and lambs which must be fed. Sabbath reform continued on. Traveling on the Sabbath. 
If we desire the blessing promised to the obedience, we must observe the Sabbath more strictly. I fear that we often travel on this day when it might be avoided. In harmony with the light which the Lord has given in regard to the observance of the Sabbath, we should be more careful about traveling on the boats or cars on this day. In these matters, we should set a right example before our children and youth in order to reach the churches that need our help and to give them the message that God desires them to hear, it may be necessary for us to travel on the Sabbath. But so far as possible, we should secure our tickets and make all necessary arrangements on some other day. When starting on our journey, we should make every possible effort to plan so as to avoid reaching our destination on the Sabbath. Many people delight on traveling on Sabbath. 6359.4 it shouldn't, it shouldn't be like this, brothers and sisters. Yes, we know you are going to preach, but this can be avoided. Avoid it. Go on Friday. Let them give you a place to spend and then be able to preach. Maybe somebody may be saying, I'm going to a girl's school. How is it possible? Yeah, we have male teachers in that school. We have a church nearby where you can be hosted and then preach on that school. We shouldn't be breaking just the Sabbath. We shouldn't be just traveling because we have to travel and preach. When compelled to travel on the Sabbath, we should try to avoid the company of those who will draw our attention to worldly things. We should keep our minds stayed upon God and commune with Him. Whenever there is opportunity, we should speak to others in regard to the truth. We should always be ready to relieve suffering and to help those in need. In such a case, God desires that the knowledge and wisdom He has given us should be put to use. But we should not talk about matters of business or engage in any common worldly conversation. At all times and in all places, God requires us to prove our loyalty to Him by honoring the Sabbath. Sabbath also, common clothing, many need instruction as how to they should appear in the sun assembly for worship on sabbath they are not to enter the presence of god in the common clothing worn during the week all should have a special sabbath suit to be worn when attending service in god's house while we should not conform to all the fashion we are not to be indifferent in regard to our outward appearance we are to be neat and trim though without adornment the children of god should be pure within and without how the priest the priest had uh, special clothes for the day of atonement for the daily ministration you may say that oh people are poor people are not rich we cannot afford a sabbath suit have one cloth which you can put aside for going to the church on a sabbath god required them also to wash their clothes he is no less particular now than he was then he is a god of order and requires his people now upon the earth to observe habits of strict cleanliness and those who worship God with uncleanly garments and persons do not come before him in an acceptable manner. He is not pleased with their lack of reverence for him, and he will not accept the service of filth worshippers, for they insult their maker. The creator of the heavens and of the earth considered cleanness of so much importance than he said, and let them wash their clothes. Uh, this is Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 233, Paragraph 2. So, I am often pained as I enter the house where God is worshipped. Why, the prophet, to see the untidy dress of both men and women? If the heart or character were indicated by the outward apparel, then certainly nothing could be heavily, heavenly about them. They have no true idea of the order, the neatness, and the refined deportment that God requires of all who come into the presence to worship him. What impression do these things give to unbelievers and to the youth who are keen to discern and to draw their conclusions. In the minds of many, there are no more sacred thoughts connected with the house of God than with the most common place. Some will enter the place of worship with their hearts on in soiled, dirty clothes. Such do not realize that they are to meet with God and holy angels. There should be a radical change in this matter all through our churches. Ministers themselves need to be elevated to elevate their ideas to have finer sustainabilities in regard to it. It is a feature of the work that has been sadly neglected because of the irreverence in attitude, dress, and deportment and lack of a worshipful frame of mind. God has often turned his face away from the, those assembled for his worship. 5T 498, paragraph 23. In entering the house of worship, you should remember that it is the house of God. Respect should be shown by the removal of the heart Remembering that you are entering into the presence of God and angels, you should teach the children reverence. Let earnest efforts be carried forward to this end and remember that you are a temple of the living God. Companies of Sabbath keepers may be raised up in many places. Often they will not be large companies, but they must be neg not neglected. 
They must not be left to die for want of proper personal effort and training. The work should not be left prematurely. See that all are intelligent in truth, established in the faith, and interested in every branch of the work before having them, uh, having them for, leaving them for another field. Look at this. Some loss of soul traced to the dress of a minister and hair disorder. A minister who is negligent in his apparel often wounds those of good taste and refined sensibilities. Those who are faulty in this respect should correct their errors and be more circumspect. The loss of some souls at last will be traced to the untidiness of the minister. The first appearance affected the people unfavorably because they could not in any way link his appearance with the truth he presented. His dress was against him, and the impression given was that the people whom he represented were a careless set who cared nothing about their dress, and his hearers did not want anything to do with such a class of people, and so they did away with the religion and they were lost. Here, according to the law that has been given me, there has been a manifest neglect among our people. Ministers sometimes stand in the desk with their hair in disorder, looking as if it had been untouched by comb and brush for a week. God is dishonored when those who engage in his sacred service are so neglectful of their appearance. Anciently, the priests were required to have their garments in particular style to do service in the holy place and minister in the priest's office. It was to show them that every particle of dust must be put away before they could go into the presence of God. For he was so high and holy that unless they did comply with this condition, death would fall. They were struck. You know, because justice is delayed, men go forward in their rebellion. But one day is coming when God will recompense these things that men are doing. Secular papers, preparation, cooking to end on Friday. On Friday, let the preparation of, for the Sabbath be completed. See that all the clothing is in readiness and that all the cooking is done. Let the boots be blackened and the baths be taken. It is possible to do this. If you make it a rule, you can do it. The Sabbath is not to be given to the repairing of garments, to the cooking of food, to pleasure seeking, or to any other world employment. Before the setting of the sun, let all secular work be laid aside and all secular papers be put out of sight. Parents explain your work and its purpose to your children and let them share in your preparation to keep the Sabbath according to the commandment. And uh, about the people who handle the Sabbath school, every teacher in the Sabbath school should be a follower of Christ. And those who have not identified themselves as the disciples of Christ, showing by a consistent life that they are Christian, should not be invited to become teachers in the Sabbath school, for they have need that some one first teach them the foundation principles of the love and fear of God. Without me, Christ says, you can do nothing. Then, of what value will be the teaching of one who knew nothing by personal experience of the power of Christ? It will be a great inconsistency to urge such a one to take a class in the Sabbath school, but it is even worse to permit a class to be under the influence of a teacher whose dress and deportment deny the Savior whom he professes to serve. Sometimes you come to the Sabbath, and even the lesson study class, and you hear, has anyone read the lesson during the week? And we hear, no one is saying that they have read the lesson. No one admits they have read the lesson. They say, we have not read the lesson. And then you, you hear, uh, so and so take care, take, take care of the lesson. Go ahead and teach the lesson. No, no, brothers and sisters, this should not be. I'm talking about a need of Sabbath reform. We are told that these things should not be. If the people have not read, the lesson, let there be not that lesson then. We have to have a Sabbath reform. We must have a Sabbath reform. Teachers and workers in every department of the Sabbath school work, I address you in the fear of God and tell you that unless you have a living connection with God and are often before him in earnest prayer, you will not be able to do your work with heavenly wisdom and win souls for Christ. The work of God must be clothed with humility as with the garment. The Lord will recognize and bless the humble worker who has a teachable spirit. A reverential love for truth and righteousness, wherever such a worker may be. If you are thus, you will show a care for your scholar by making special efforts for their salvation. 
You will come close to them in loving sympathy, visiting them at their homes, learning their true condition by conversing with them concerning the experience and the things of God, and you will bear them in the arms of your faith to the throne of the Father. Sabbath meetings. Christ said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 18 20. Wherever there are many or two or three believers, let them meet together on the Sabbath to claim the Lord's promise. The little companies assembled to worship God on his holiday have a right to claim the rich blessing of Jehovah. They should believe that the Lord Jesus is honored guest in the assemblies. Every true worshiper who keeps holy the Sabbath should claim the promise that ye may know that I am the Lord that do sanctify the Exodus 31 13. This is 16. Testimony to the Church, Volume 6, page 316. Uh, on about uh, Council on uh, Southern Work, that is uh, page 182, paragraph 1 and 2, about gifts on a Sabbath. Listen to this. On Sabbath morning, Marshalltown, Iowa, come, come Grand August 1684. A large company made for Sabbath school. Classes were soon arranged, including all except a few who chose seats outside the tent. But these were not left to themselves. Teachers were appointed, and two or three interesting classes formed. All were as busy as bees, and everywhere in the tent and out of it was heard the hum of voices. The school was well conducted and orderly, and to me, the exercises were very interesting. By request, I spoke about 30 minutes, warning them against letting their Sabbath school degenerate into a mere mechanical routine. We should not seek to imitate Sunday schools, nor keep up the interest by offering prizes. The offering of rewards will create rivalry, envy, and jealousy, and some who are the most diligent and worthy will receive little credit. Scholars should not try to see how many verses they can learn and repeat, for this brings too great a strain upon the ambitious child, while the rest become discouraged. Try none of these methods in your Sabbath schools. This issue of coming with lollipops in the church, sweets, and asking questions and giving them to children who are others and leaving others, this is Sunday worship. And it should be shunned in Seventh day Adventism. We should not be giving prizes to our children. You discourage others, you make others have a low self esteem. This Sunday worshiping in Seventh day Adventism is encroaching the church, and the church is retreating back to Egypt. There is to be, a, there need to be a Sabbath reform in this last day, the, the reforms that Nehemiah did. As means of intellectual training, the opportunities of the Sabbath are invaluable. Let the Sabbath school lesson be learned not by a hasty glance at the lesson scripture on Sabbath morning, but by careful study for the next week on Sabbath afternoon with daily review or illustration during the week. Thus, the lesson will become fixed in the memory, a treasure never to be wholly lost. Those who are possessing the lesson, read it throughout the week. Review it and on Sabbath afternoon, go through the afternoon section. And during the Sabbath school lesson, controversy should be avoided. While there is need of thorough investigation of the Word of God, that precious truth may be discovered and brought to light, we should be guided that the spirit of controversy does not control in our discussions of the school Sabbath, of the Sabbath school lesson. In bringing out point upon which there may be a difference of opinion, the grace of Christ should be manifested by those who are seeking for an understanding of the Word of God. There should be liberty given for frank investigation of truth that each may know for himself what is truth. Among the pupils of the Sabbath school, there should be a spirit of investigation that those who are old enough to discern evidence may be encouraged to search for fresh rays of light and to appreciate all that God may send to his people. The light which God will send to his people will never appear unless there is diligent searching of the word of truth. It is not just going over the lesson. And it's not just about controversy and introducing side issues. We need a people who are thoroughly winnowed. We need a people who are actually need to Christ and their hearts are there uh, to educate. The preaching at our Sabbath meeting should be generally be short. Opportunity should be given for those who love God to express their gratitude and adoration. This is never done. When the church is without a minister, someone should be appointed as a leader of the meeting. 
but it is not necessary for him to preach a sermon or, or to occupy a large part of the time of service. A short, interesting Bible reading will often be of greater benefit than a sermon, and this can be followed by a meeting of meeting uh, a meeting for prayer and testimony. Those who occupy a large a leading position in the church should not exhaust their physical and mental strength through the week so that on the Sabbath they are unable to bring the vivifying influence of the gospel of Christ in the meeting. Ministers should not be overworking during the week and then come to the Sabbath when they are too weak, too uh, uh, weak to present a sermon or uh, too tired. Do less temporal everyday labor but do not rob God by giving him on the Sabbath service which he cannot accept. You should not be as men who have no spiritual life. The people need your help on the Sabbath. Give them food from the word. Bring your choices gift to God on this, on his holiday. Let the precious life of the soul be given to him in consecrated service. Let none come to the place of worship to take a nap. There should be no sleeping in the house of God. You do not fall asleep when engaged in your temporal business because you have an interest in your work. Shall we allow the service which involves eternal interest to be placed on a lower level than the temporal affairs of life? And I heard one pastor say that uh, let people sleep, they do not sleep in their houses. The only safe place they can sleep and not think of being killed either by a wife or a husband is in the church. What, what kind of suggestions are those? The church is not a place for sleeping. In many places where the message has been preached and soul have been reached, accepted and soul have accepted it they are in limited circumstances and can do but little towards securing advantage that they will give character to the work often this renders it difficult to the extended to extend the work a persons as persons become interested in the truth they are told by the ministers of their churches and these words are echoed by the church members these people have no church and you have no place of worship you are a small company poor and unlearned in a short time, the ministers will go away and then the interest will die down. Then you will give up all the new ideas which you have received. And we have heard even in our churches ministers saying that if you don't improve in your tithe and offering, we will close this church. What kind of utterances are these, brothers and sisters? This should not be found among the Seventh-day Adventists. The things that are happening in our churches really calls for tears. You, you can't tell people and uh, there is a certain church that I was attending. The, the people there are old men. Their children don't have jobs. They are struggling to feed the family. And all they can raise maybe in a month for tithes and offering is uh, uh, um, 200 US dollars. That is 20,000 Kenya shillings. And then they are told that this money is too small this church will be closed up. Well, the people are working themselves out to make sure that the church is running. What kind of utterances are these on the Sabbath, our pastors and elders? Is God worshipped by money or is God worshipped with sincere soul who are striving to conform to the law of God? It really pains. It leaves me without words to speak. Are there, are there not seventh day Adventists who will do likewise? Instead of keeping the ministers at work for the churches that already know the truth, let the members of the churches say to these believers, Go work for souls that are perishing in darkness. We ourselves will carry forward the service of the church. We will keep up the meetings and by abiding in Christ, we will maintain spiritual life. We will work for the souls that are about us and we will send our prayers and our gifts to sustain the labors in more needy and destitute fields. Instead of having this sitting pastors, of the churches, they should be sent out to do a job. And uh, we are almost coming to an end. And uh, I, I won't go to the how to build the Sabbath school. Let me just look at this, eating in the house of God. Even the church which should be the pillar and ground of the truth is found encouraging a selfish love of pleasure. When money is raised for religious purposes, to what means do many churches resort to bazaars, suppers, fancy fairs, even to lotteries and like devices. Often the place set apart for God's worship is discreted by feasting, drinking, buying, selling and merrymaking. Respect for the house of God and revenue for his worship 
a lesson, reverence for his worship a lesson in the minds of the youth. The barriers of self-restraint are weakened. Selfishness, appetite, the love of display are appealed to and they strengthen as they are indulged. 1991.3 How should the rest of the Sabbath hours be kept? The Sabbath school and the meeting for worship occupy only a part of the Sabbath. The portion remaining for the family may be made the most sacred and precious season of all the Sabbath hours. Much of this time parents should spend with their children. In many families, the younger children are left to themselves to find entertainment as best they can. Left alone, the children so on uh, become restless and begin to play or engage in some kind of mischief. Thus, the Sabbath has to them no sacred significance. In pleasant weather, let parents walk with their children in the fields and groves. Amid the beautiful things of nature, tell them the reason for the institution of the Sabbath and ask, uh, present before the children Jesus as a child obedient to his parents, as a youth faithful and industrious, helping to support the family. Thus you can teach them that the Savior knows the trials, perplexities, and temptations, the hopes and joys of the young, and that he can give them sympathy and help. From time to time, read with them the interesting stories in the Bible. Question as to what they have learned in the Sabbath school and study with them the next Sabbath lesson. It is not a must that the whole Sabbath should be spent in church. Go out with the children. And uh, as the sun goes down, let the voice of prayer and the hymn of praise mark the close of the sacred hours and invite God's presence through the cares of the weak labor. Circumstances may occur to separate the children from their parents and their, and their home. But as long as they live, the instruction given in childhood and youth will be a blessing. Another thing that can be done on Sabbath is missionary training on Sabbath afternoon. These experiences prepared their hearts to appreciate and receive instruction regarding the value of missionary effort as part of their education. As this subject was presented in the school and in the church during the week of prayer, students and teachers sought to act upon the suggestion and opportunities for labor were found in all directions. Sabbath and Sunday afternoons from 16 to 20 students are engaged in holding prayer meetings, Bible readings, young people's meetings, and preaching services in from six to ten different places. One result of this work we already see, the workers are greatly blessed. Other results may be seen in the future. And uh, palatable food should be given on a Sabbath. And we are told at last, we should jealously guard the edges of the Sabbath. Remember that every moment is conse consecrated holy time. Whenever it is possible, employers should give their workers the hours from Friday noon until the beginning of the Sabbath. Give them time for preparation that they may welcome the Lord's Day with quietness of mind. By such a course, you will suffer no less loss even in temporal things. Business transactions, as we saw, should not be discussed on Sabbath. But acts of necessity can be done. Uh, and so the, there need to be a Sabbath reform amongst us as a people. The Sabbath of the Lord has been discredited so much. The Sabbath of God has been uh, discredited so much. And uh, God is raising up a people who can be sentinels of truth and restore the true worship in Israel. And so, in conclusion, the word Sabbath means seizing, and the first rever references to this day as a day of rest, seizing from labor for the people are in Exodus 16, 23 to 30. The basis for this seize day is Genesis 1, 1 and uh, 2, 3. In imitation of their creator, the ancient Israelites were to work six days but seize from their labors on the seventh day and uh, to keep it holy and to consecrate it to the Lord. And uh, this is what we are still being asked to do. This requirement extended to foreigners residing among God's people and even to animals. This was part of covenant sign in Exodus 31, 13 to 17 and Ezekiel 20, 12, Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 14. Repeats this requirement but adds another rationale. Israel's deliverance from the slavery of Egypt by the mighty hand of God. 
when we keep the Sabbath, we show that the Lord has delivered us from Egypt, from the world. The people were no longer to work as they had in slavery. Rather, they were to work only six days and seize all labor on the seventh day as a free people. Violating this law carried dire consequences. Nehemiah knew all this. Today we celebrate the new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 We serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the rich and core. Romans 7, 6. Those in Christ are not under the law but under grace. What does it mean not to be under the law? It means that you have conformed to the law. You are under the grace. That is the Spirit of Christ. This, you have the Spirit of the law and the law is the, the, the Spirit is guiding you to conform to the law of God. That is what it means to be under the grace and not under the law. To be under grace is not a license for lawlessness. To be in spirit doesn't mean that you are lawlessness. But certain requirements of the Old Testament law no longer apply. This includes Sabbath keeping, Colossians 2.16. So people say that if you are under uh, the grace, then you cannot keep the Sabbath because Colossians 2.16 talks about that. That's not even so the principles of resting at least one day a week is good principle. But the Sabbath is the Lord's day. It is not uh, something that uh, actually also our Christian liberty requires that we tolerate of those who honor certain days above others. We should not now just start hurling the inundation and while we are keeping the Sabbath holy we also keep in mind that the ultimate Sabbath rest awaits us at Jesus return and it's only those who have practiced it here on earth that will be able to live with Christ. The Lord's Day is a special gift from God and we should honor it as such. Our choices on the Lord's Day may indicate our real priorities. God wants us to have a day of rest and worship. We neglect it at our own loss. Lastly, properly setting apart the Lord's Day may require some practical limitation for ourselves and others. Serving God fully may sometimes require drastic measures. Choose to do right and God will care for the details. This is the lesson that we get. And so I pray that um, the Lord will rejuvenate you. The Lord will give you grace so that you may be able to keep his Sabbath holy. Even I'm wishing everyone a blessed Sabbath. It is almost sundowner here in Kenya and uh, in East Africa. And wherever you are, remember to keep the Sabbath holy and be part of the Nehemiah movement to do the Sabbath reformations. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you because you knew the frailty of human being and gave them the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now we cannot keep it and say that which is a right, Lord. May you impart on us thy spirit that, Lord, we may walk in thy statutes. Thank you for this day. Thank you for thy love and thank you for thy mercies. As we enter into the Sabbath, we pray that you may minister to us as we minister to others. Forgive us, Lord, for where we have gone wrong in these things. Reunite us unto thyself by the blood of thy Son. Sanctify us and set us apart, set us apart for thy holy service. For this we request in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a blessed Sabbath.